Happy New Year, everyone. Dr. Polaris here. Let's return to Alter Earth. The Oligocene ice house climate continued to cool, with dry open woodlands spreading across the North American continent. The survivors of the Grand Coupre extinction event are going from strength to strength, with dinosaur diversity almost back up to late Eocene levels. Despite the presence of an intermittent Beringian land bridge connecting the continent to Asia, North American faunal communities contain a fairer degree of endemic animals. Indeed, several groups that became extinct at the Eocene-Oligocene boundary in Eurasia have survived here. The reasons for this are not well understood though at present. Although the derived ceratopsids have vanished, their Cretaceous contemporaries, the Hadrosaurids and the Tyrannosaurids, are still going strong. The Canalophine hadrosaurs are the most common large herbivores. Originating during the Middle Eocene, these animals went through a meteoric rise in diversity during the Oligocene. Up to six tribes roamed North America, ranging from relatively small 5 metre long desert specialists to massive 18 metre long high browsers. Some genera possessed ridiculously flamboyant cranial ornamentation, which, when combined with prominent nasal balloons, strongly suggests gregarious herding behaviour. Much like Cretaceous hadrosaurids, this ornamentation likely serves as a form of sexual display along with species recognition. Canalophine remains have been found in huge numbers, allowing us to imagine a time when great herds of these hadrosaurs blanketed the woodlands and savannas of the American West. Adults would have been preyed upon by Dynamo tyrannosaurines, while young and juvenile animals were open to attack by Boreoraptorian dromaeosaurs, Ochisoraptorid oviraptorosaurs, and Nyctoraptorid troodontans. Joining the Canalophines browsing in the woodlands were the Novoceratopsians. These herbivores were descended from Leptoceratopsids and split off from their ancestors by the late Eocene. Initially quite small at up to 4 metres long, this group diversified massively in the Oligocene. Owing their rise in fortunes to the demise of their larger Ceratopsid cousins, the Novoceratopsians simply moved into vacated niches. Originally hornless and lacking neck frills, these Ceratopsians convergently evolved these features rather rapidly. By the later Oligocene, some genera possessed a combination of both brow horns, neck frills and elongated jugal horns. Indeed, it was these jugal horns that were one of the main anatomical identifiers of this group. By the middle Oligocene, Roughly seven genera of these ceratopsians dwelt in North America, measuring in the area of five to seven metres in length, and inhabited a browsing niche much like those of black rhinos from our Earth. Other smaller herbivores were present in force as well. On the ornithischian side of the equation, there were several families of pachycephalosaurs and the semi-aquatic thecellosaurids. The pachycephalosaurs were the more common grouping, inhabiting the small, speedy herbivore niche left vacant by the extinction of the rhododromids. Some of these were very small animals, especially the paleocornids, which measured between 1 to 2 metres long, and would have been skittish and antelope-like. Unlike the stereotypical image of pachycephalosaurs, these animals only had the slightest thickening of the skull roof and were specialised for fast running. The closely related but more derived Presidio serratids were larger, even more cursorial in nature, and possessed a complex array of cranial ornamentation. A more marginal group, the Dorsodontids, were intermediate in size and had a higher tooth count more adapted for grazing on C3 grasses that were becoming more common at the time. The Thessalosaurids were quite low in diversity during the Oligocene of North America, being limited to a total of four genera across the entire period. All of these were semi-aquatic to some degree, living a somewhat hippo-like lifestyle in the lakes and rivers that dotted the continent. They were still bipedal animals when walking on land, and would have seemed a little Godzilla-like while emerging from the water. By the early Miocene they would disappear altogether, a rather mysterious occurrence given that their close relatives thrived in Eurasia and Africa. Leaving the Ornithischians behind, we now come to the herbivorous theropods. By the Middle Oligocene, there were several lineages of these in North America. The high-browsing Nothrosaurids, 
the Rheomimid rhynchorostrans and the Canaanathiform oviraptorosaurs. Both the Nothrosaurids and the Rheomimids were descended from late Cretaceous troodontids, but had specialised in quite different directions. The Nothrosaurids were large, bulky browsers reminiscent of Therizinosaurs and adapted for a sedentary style of feeding, similar to that of the gorillas, pandas and ground sloths of our Earth. They still possessed small, leaf-shaped teeth in their narrow jaws. The Rheomimids, on the other hand, were members of the derived Troodontan clade Rhynchorostra. All members of this grouping were toothless, beaked animals, and the Rheomimids were no exception. With the extinction of the Ornithomimosaurs in North America by the early Oligocene, the ancestors of the Rheomimids entered their niche. As their name suggests, these cursorial omnivores were similar to the large flightless paleonaths of our Earth. Canaanathiform oviraptorosaurs were also herbivorous to a greater or lesser extent. The cranosaurids were smallish animals with a broad range of diets depending on the genus concerned. As with the pigs of our Earth, some cranosaurids were almost entirely herbivorous, while others were very flexible omnivores. The only way in which these animals could be compared to pigs, however, is in terms of diets. These were leggy, slender animals that used a quick turn of speed to escape from predators. Most also possessed some form of head crest, used for display or species recognition. Another oviraptorosaur family, the Brontavids, were certainly less herbivorous. These bulky animals were up to 8 metres in length, with massive, heavily constructed skulls like those of the Dromornithids from Our Earth Australia. Brontavids were not fussy about their food, eating pretty much anything that they were capable of crushing with their beaks. Meanwhile, the Ochisoraptorids, derived cousins of the Brontavids, were more exclusively carnivorous and were the main medium-sized predators in North America from the early Oligocene to the early Pliocene. Unlike the Dromaeosaurs, the Ochisoraptorids were not ambush hunters, instead opting for stamina over speed. There are also indications that these animals were cooperative hunters to some degree, although we are currently unsure as to the extent of this behaviour. Members of this group range from 2.5 to 7 metres long, and varied quite a bit in terms of ecological niche. The smaller, more basal genre would have been somewhat coyote-like carnivores preying on lizards, snakes, mammals and young herbivorous dinosaurs. The larger, more derived species would have actively hunted larger prey, chasing down hadrosaurs, novoceratopsians and other herbivorous theropods over long distances. Dromaeosaurs continued on as they had been since the Cretaceous, stealthy, sickle-clawed ambush predators. The Boreoraptorians were the largest and most common of these, ranging from 3.5 to 7 metres long, with heavy builds and massive pedal talons. Although not adapted for fast running, they would have been quick over short distances. These were adaptations that clearly worked in their favour, as the Boreoraptorians were very successful and maintained a large presence across the entire Northern Hemisphere. Their decline would come later, during the Miocene, due to both increased competition with other predatory dinosaurs and environmental changes. During the Oligocene, however, they lived in something of a golden age. The only other group of dromaeosaurs present in North America were the Velociraptorines. They were smaller than the Boreoraptorine cousins and would have hunted lizards, mammals and other small dinosaurs. Velociraptorines seem to have been rare animals, to date, only three genera have been recovered from the early and middle Oligocene. By the end of the epoch, they would disappear altogether, likely due to competition from the Ochisoraptorids and the more carnivorous beaked Rhynchorostrans. Speaking of Rhynchorostrans, these adaptable beaked troodontid descendants were ubiquitous in Oligocene North America. These Paravians started out as two metre long generalist omnivores, but, after the Grand Coupre extinction event, diversified explosively. By the Middle Oligocene, two major groups dwelt in western North America, the Nyctoraptorids and the Rheomimids. The former were generally modest in size, usually between 2 and 3 metres in length, and were omnivorous to some degree. Slim and quite graceful in build, they could be compared to the foxes, jackals or procyonids from our Earth. 
Their appearance in the fossil record coincides with the extinction of the smaller toothed troodontids, suggesting that the Nyctoraptorids outcompeted their more basal relatives. The Rheomimids, as mentioned above, were speedy ornithomimosaur analogues and were quite close relatives of the Nyctoraptorids. Finally, we come to the apex predators of Oligocene North America, the Tyrannosaurs. At the beginning of the epoch, there were two families of these hypercarnivores prowling the continent. These were the Simotyrannosaurids and the Tyrannosaurids. The former were stocky, heavy-set scavengers with short, blunt skulls, while the latter were the familiar, massive beasts we all know and love. Specifically, the only remaining Tyrannosaurids were members of a single subfamily, the Dynamotyrannosaurines. Originating in the late Paleocene, these animals were the dominant macro predators in North America until the early Miocene, when they fell into a terminal decline. In the Oligocene, however, they were the unquestioned rulers of their domain. The next largest carnivorous dinosaurs in their ecosystems were only up to half their size. Dynamotyrannosaurians possessed enlarged ridges of bone above the eyes, and, more bizarrely, their necks and backs were covered in keratinized scales derived from protofeathers. Why this feature evolved in the first place is uncertain, but it may have to do with increased intraspecific competition for mates or resources, leading to natural selection favouring the development of increased defensive measures. Outside of the non-avian dinosaurs, our knowledge of Oligocene North American faunal communities is a little shakier. Pterosaur fossils are rare and often fragmentary, particularly those found in land. We do know, however, that as Darkoids dominated terrestrial environments, while the Pteranodontids and Nyctosaurids were masters of the coasts and open oceans. Mammal remains, while abundant, often consist of teeth or pieces of jawbone, leaving us in the dark concerning their overall life appearance. Despite this, Eutherians and Multituberculates are the most commonly represented groups. Eutherians were quite diverse animals, ranging from tiny, shrew-like insectivores to cursorial browsers the size of hares. True placentals are rare and are present in the form of nocturnal, hedgehog-like omnivores and scansorial fruit and seed-eating animals. Multituberculates are still the dominant gnawing rodent analogues and remain common. Representatives of the Tilodontids, Taniolaboids, Jatochgatheroids and more were present in all sorts of niches, ranging from squirrel-like arborealism to large digging herbivores. Metatherians have declined somewhat in terms of diversity since their Paleogene heyday, but are still climbing about in the trees as opossum-like generalists, foraging on the ground as nocturnal insectivores, and, most conspicuously, as the largest predatory mammals of the time, the Stagodontids. Descended from Didelphodon-type ancestors, the Stagodontids are generally long-bodied, vaguely mustelid or badger-like animals with very strong jaws and crushing molars. The Squamates and Pseudosuchians are poorly known, but the presence of Varanoids, Iguanians, Taeids, Anguimorphs, Amphisbanians, Shinisaurids, Snakes and Polyglyphandontians is certain. Alligatorids and Borealosuchids are the only Pseudosuchian groups known thus far. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be back with a video concerning the evolution of orangutans and their fossil relatives. See you again soon. Cheerio.